Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to another session of Authors on the Air, part of the Global Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. I'm James Latwell, your host, and it's my pleasure today to sit down with with not only an amazing writer, but uh, just a, one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in this business, and that's Wanda Morris. Hi, Wanda. Hey, Jim. How are you? Thank you for that kind introduction. Well, it's it's very very true. Um, you're you're one of those special people that. Uh, everywhere you go i mean it's just like this light uh, in a room um and speaking of light i mean you were the toastmaster at left coast crime and and uh from where i was sitting it looked like you just had a blast oh my gosh i had so much fun i had so much fun yeah i was tired though i slept for like two days after i got home because <laughs> i was just running full steam but i had so much fun that was nice. Yeah, it was, it was great to see your family there and everything else. It was really, it was really a, a good, a good time. It was a good event. It so, was. It was I, I love that conference. It's like my favorite conference. It's so much. It fun. is a good one. But today we're here to talk about Wanda's newest book, What You Leave Behind. And I mean, if you don't know anything about Wanda's books, I mean, with, you know, all her, all her little secrets and, and anywhere you run, who, those those books racked up just about every award nomination and award possible in this industry. I mean, it's it's just amazing. Every everywhere you went, Wanda was you know nominated for something, and deservedly so. I mean, they were they were fantastic books. But but this one, Wanda, I mean, this one is something special. Um, I I got chills reading this one. This was a fantastic book. Um, can you tell folks a little bit about what's going on in in what you leave behind? Sure. Um, first, thank you very much for that. Um, every writer loves to hear that. So What You Leave Behind is the story of Dina Wood, who um, has like a trifecta of misfortune. She um, has just gotten divorced from her husband, who was a horrible person. Um, she has just been fired from her job, and she's still grieving the death of her mother. Um, and so she returns home to Brunswick, Georgia, to kind of lick her wounds and get her life back together. And um, as part of her grieving process, she drives around town, you know, to kind of clear her head, kind of searching for, you know, memories of her mother. And she stumbles upon the um, oceanfront land of an older gentleman one day who's living out on the land in a trailer with his dog. And he runs her off the property because he mistakenly thinks she's there to purchase the land. Um, and she can't seem to get him out of her head. So she goes back to the land um, a week later and the man is gone. Trailer's gone, his dog is gone, and there's a for sale sign up on the property. And Dina is a bit of a nosy Nelly, and she starts to think, what happened to that guy? And he was adamant he wouldn't sell his property, and now it's up for sale. So she starts to dig around, and she uncovers um, a really sinister scheme that undermines the generational wealth of poor and disenfranchised people. Yeah, and you... You know, that's kind of one of the major themes in the book is that that heirs property, you know, <laughs> loophole in the in the law. And I didn't give it a lot of you know thought out here in in the West where I'm at, but I guess on the East Coast and the South, especially in some of those 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 rural areas, I can really see where that would happen. Just pet families are passing down their their homes and, and from one generation to the next, and there's some some loopholes uh, out there. How did how did you come across that that concept and and how did it become the germ for this for this novel? Oh, that's a really good question. It's um it's interesting. And and just as an aside, um, heirs property happens across the country. Um, tends to happen um, more often in rural areas, but it can happen in big cities as well. But um, I was watching the news one evening, just folding up laundry and watching the news. And a story came on and the reporter was interviewing a woman whose home had been damaged by Hurricane Florence. I think it was, this was in South Carolina. 
And she was telling the reporter that she couldn't get her home repaired because she couldn't prove to FEMA, to the government, that she owned the property because she had been born in that house and her mother had been born in the house and then her mother's mother had been born in the house. But as each generation died, whoever lived in the house, that's who the house just passed down to. So there was no will, there was no deed. And because she couldn't prove that she owned the property, she couldn't get FEMA funds. And I turned the news off and I thought to myself, it's like a crime in plain sight, right? How horrendous is that? And I didn't even know it at the time that I would go on to write a a book about this because this happened like back before my first book was published. Um, But it it stayed with me. It, It really did stay with me. And the more I dug into it, the more I thought um, how horrific this is because not only is it the loss of, you know, property that sits right there and land that, that sits there physically, but it's the loss of generational wealth, right? Because what you leave behind for your kids and then they go on to build on that, to leave that for their kids. And so it's the loss of that generational wealth. And um, I know that this happens quite a bit in um, Gullah Geechee communities of low country, Georgia. And I thought, hmm, this might make, you know, like most mystery writers, throw in a dead body or two and hey, pretty soon you've got, you've got a story. So <laughs> that's how it kind of came about. Oh, that's very true. Now, um, your, your protagonist, Dina, um, she, she's really a great character. I, I mean, you mentioned that she, you know, she's gone through this triple trauma and she's kind of starting her life over again. And she settles into a job that I think is, is really below her, her abilities. I mean, she's, she's, she's a a good lawyer and she's kind of eking away at at an existence here. How did you come up with putting her into that kind of a a situation uh, and not just having her as a high powered attorney in some, some firm? I knew that this particular character would return home to her community to do something much bigger than herself, right? She unwillingly, unbeknownst to her, but she would have to do something to help, you know, the larger community. And so I needed to put her in a place where you know, her confidence is broken. She doesn't think she has the capability to do that, right? And so she suffered yeah. all this misfortune and she believes that she can't even get her own life together. So how is she in a position to help other people? And that becomes her character arc, right? How she winds up not only helping herself because in doing this, it gets her through the grief, but she also winds up helping this much larger um, community. So I, you know, I, here's the thing too. The book starts off like in a really bad place, right? She, she uh-huh. is going through it and there's lots of grief in the book. And I always thought I would never write a book about grief. Like I've suffered much too much of it. And I thought, uh, that's just not a topic that I want to tackle. But it's so interesting. It was almost like it was cathartic for me as I was writing this book and, um, you know, kind of evolving her character through this journey of grief. It so helped me figure out kind of how my grieving process works because everybody grieves differently. Um, sure. But yeah, I, I knew that she was going to be a character who had to go from one really desperate, lonely place to something much larger and much, much bigger. Yeah. You, <coughs> excuse me. You, you have a knack, uh, and not only in this book, uh, your characters. Um, you're, you're able to present them in a way that seems like we've known them forever. They're very familiar to us. They're very comfortable. Uh, like Dina, just after a few pages, I was there with her on this story. I mean, you know, she was right there. That's a that's a that's a skill, Wanda. And how do, how did you manage to to create characters 
like that that people feel you know very comfortable and and familiar with. Oh, thank you for that. You know what I what I try to do with my characters, I don't have some grand elaborate plan, but I try to write characters like the people that I know, right? That are just trying to make it through their lives. In all her little secrets, this was a woman who was a lawyer and by all means very successful, but she was just trying to live with a really, really dark secret and, and how she you know, presented herself in the world and how she interacted with people um, was a result of that that secret. And, you know, similarly with Dina, she is struggling with all this grief and misfortune. And, you know, how do you, how do you interact with other people when you're going through that? What does that look like? How do you present yourself to the world? You know, at, near the beginning of the book, you know, Dina goes into her uncle's barbershop and she's like, oh, hey, Uncle Duke. And inside she thinks, you know, yeah, I'm coming across as everything's OK. But everybody that sees her, they're like, "Ooh, that poor girl, you know, and she realizes in that moment, like, oh, my gosh, like I must be carrying around my grief like an old coat or something. Um, and so I just try to make them like you and I, I mean, we're not all good. We're not all bad. We're not perfect. You know, we're just trying to get through life and get to the next day and do whatever we can do. Um, so. Yeah. Now your first book was, you know, contemporary setting. Then, then your, the most recent one, the second book was historical. Mm -hmm. And now this one, you've kind of blended the two a little bit. Um, was that a conscious thought or no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you know what? It didn't even occur to me, Jim, until I was reading a review of the book and someone said, oh, yes, now she, you know, they said exactly what you said. Her first book was contemporary. <laughs> second book was historical. And look at here. She does them both. And I was like, hey, I didn't even realize I did that. Look, <laughs> look yes, here. Yes, I did. <laughs> right? Yes, I did. It was it. not, it was not, but because I wanted to explore this community in which Dina lives and which she comes from, which is the Gullah Geechee community, right. I wanted the story to be um, grounded in, you know, authenticity. And so that meant looking back at what made this culture so rich and vibrant. And that comes out of the history, the uh, Gullah Geechee community is uh, a community of direct descendants from formerly enslaved people brought here from um, Central and West Africa. And a lot of their community is tied into um, how they feel about the land on which they live, as well as um, the people who have died before them, all of that music, spirituality. And so I, you know, really wanted to make sure that I grounded the story in all of that. And so that's where the historical part of the story comes in. Yeah. And I, I think it does add a lot of texture to the story that you're telling, because without that, that historical grounding, uh, you, I don't think you get as much out of, you know, what, what she's feeling from these other, the other forces that, you know, show up in the, in this story. I don't want to give too much away for people, but uh, I thought it was, yeah, it, it gave it a lot more texture to to the entire entire story. So I, I thought that was really, really, again, really, just really well done. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Now, Dina, you know, I I'd say I really like that character, and it's kind of set up for it. Will we see another Dina book? <sighs> I don't know. Like. People ask me that after my first book, they're like, oh, you got to write all her little secrets part two. And I was like, maybe. And then I go on to write a historical novel. And so, you know, <laughs> I'm asked the same thing about this. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe. Um, but but who knows? I would love, love, love to revisit these characters because yeah. they some of them are like 
people snatched right out of my own family. You know, Uncle Duke and her father, Jimmy, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, Rue, all these people. Um, as I describe the story, it really is a love story. Um, it is a love story between um, all these various characters, of course. You have, you know, Dina, whose mother has died and her father's remarried her mother's best friend. So that's messy. All my books have a little bit of messy in them. Um, uh -huh. and, and then you have the second chance love story between Howie and Dina. But there's also this underlying love story between the Gullah Geechee community and the land and how tied, how intimately tied they are to this land that, you know, they are directly descended from and, and toiled on. So it's all kind of undergirding, you know, like I said, it's it's just one big old love story with, um, you know, a few dead bodies thrown in. Thrown <laughs> in, yeah. Now, since since Dina is, is a lawyer, um, and that's that's your your vocation, mm -hmm. um, how did that background help you uh, or did it get in the way of you as as a crime writer? Um, gosh, it it was a blessing and a curse. Let me put it that way. It, it's a blessing because, um, you know, my stories that center around um, some aspect of the law certainly gives me a leg up on like research and, and how to put it into the book. It's a curse because lawyers write so vastly different from fictional yeah. writers. Um, and so when I was first starting out and, oh gosh, when I was trying to get an agent, I, you know, it was just brutal because my writing was still very stilted, much like the writing of a lawyer. Um, and so I had to learn how to like write a book, how to write creatively. Um, but, you know, the thing about it, lawyers are taught to be persuasive in their writing. And I think that that's an aspect that I build upon in my creative writing journey, because I think I am trying to persuade the reader. I want to I want the reader to feel a certain way when they pick up my book. And, you know, by the time they get to the middle of the book, they're either like, what the hell is going on? Or they're weeping mercilessly. You know, like, I want the reader to feel some kind of way. Right. And so I think that's kind of the persuasive aspect that I get from my legal career. Yeah, I, I think you do that. And yeah, this does not read like an appellate brief. Okay, I'll, I'll just tell people <laughs> out there right now. This, this is enjoyable to read. The other stuff, not so much. So you've done a good job there. So if if we're not going to see another Dina book next, what is next coming from you, Wanda? Ah, I tell people, you know, I never thought that I would write a book about grief. I just thought, ooh, I don't want to delve into those feelings, those personal feelings, particularly around the death of a mother. I lost my mother when I was young and I was like, eh, I don't want to go there. Um, and then I wound up writing a book about grief. Um, and so I used to say, oh, I'll never write a serial killer book because that's just way too much um, darkness for me. Um, and so my next book is a serial killer book. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> you know, never say never. I, I'm learning the hard way. Never say never. Um, <laughs> But the 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 quick and dirty premise is um, young wealthy couples here in Atlanta are um, are found murdered and their children have gone missing, and two detectives um, are out to find what has happened um, to the children and who's the killer, and it. Um, winds up becoming a cat and mouse chase uh, because these detectives are chasing a killer they never saw coming. Nice. I can't wait for that. Okay, we're going to end up with uh, what we call three quick hits and put yourself in, in Dina's mind and let me know what is Dina's favorite cocktail or her drink of choice? Oh, yeah. I got this one. Um, she is not big on drinking, but she'll take an occasional champagne. 
Um, and the reason why I say that is because she really likes to celebrate, but lately she's had no reason to. <laughs> but she, yeah, she always likes champagne. Good, I like that. Um, how about Dina's favorite music? What does she listen to? Oh, she likes R and B and jazz. Mm -hmm. I, I can see that. And finally, what is Dina's greatest fear? Oh, that's a good one. I think her greatest fear has to be that she will not get her life together again, that her mother's death has so um, has so impacted her um, that, and, and I think I write something in the book that you know, she um, she's really lost because the person that she usually goes to whenever she has heartache has now become the source of it. And I think her greatest fear is that she will never be able to get her life together after all that has happened. I get it. I understand that that, that makes perfect sense. Thank you, folks. We've been talking with Wanda Morris. Wanda is the author of this new book, What You Leave Behind, and pre-order it, order it, get it, because everybody's going to be talking about it, and you don't want to be left out. So, Wanda, thanks so much for coming on Authors on the Air and talking with us today. Ah, oh, Jim, thank you for having me. This was a blast. A blast. We'll see you soon. You take care. Take care.